Well, good morning, everyone. How are we doing this morning? I'm doing good. You guys are the early service, so you guys had to get up extra early, right? I know I was up at, I think it was like 5 a.m. Uh, there was a lot going on. We had the dog. We had, we had Jude and Ella, so We had kids. And it was just all over the place. Waking up at 5 a.m., that was fun. Um, I'm so happy to be here this morning to be able to just bring a message that God has really been working with myself um, to, to, to bring to you guys this morning. But before we do that, I want to welcome any new time, um, any visitors that might be here this morning. We are glad you are here, and we're glad you're part of our family this morning. If you're watching on YouTube or listening on our podcast, we want to welcome you as well, um, and we're glad that you're here this morning with us. Last week, we, we finished up our uh, sermon series on Ruth, and Louie did a phenomenal job at concluding that service, or that series. <clears throat> But we really learned through that series how God will work in the ordinary, how God will, if you take a step back, if you look at lens further back, you will see that God is working in those ordinary, those mundane things that are going on in our lives. We see that in the story uh, with Ruth, and we see it with Boaz, and we see it with Naomi, time after time after time, about how God brings redemption and hope. Today, as we kind of are shift our perspective a little bit, we still need the God that is in the ordinary, right? We still need a God that is so concerned about the things of, that are in our, in our daily lives, all those mundane things. But we also serve a God, we also get to have a relationship with a God who wants to dive deep with us, that desires to have a relationship that grows us and matures our faith. Because kind of, I'd be real, we live in a world that is full of craziness, full of deception and confusion and things that go on that just bring chaos. And we need a God who comes into that, into those moments, into those times that we need him and just brings such clarity to our lives. I know that's true for myself. Um, when I was uh, growing up in a church in Downey, um, I was in kids' ministry all through high school, and I loved serving in kids' ministry. I loved it. Um, one night, when I was sitting in my dorm room, and I was, in, I was going to Life Pacific College. I attended there for a couple years, yeah. Um, I had a moment in my dorm room where I was just frustrated. I was mad. I was like, I don't know what, God, what you're doing in my life. I don't know how to move forward. Where are you taking me? Um, and I was working on this homework assignment, and that was what really was frustrating me. Because God, I was like, in the back of my mind, I have this going on. And God, what are you calling me to? What are you doing? But then I had to finish this homework assignment that looked like Greek and Hebrew, but it wasn't. Um, it could have been, but it wasn't. Um, but I remember God saying, shut it down. Close it all up. It's not important. It's not important. I don't need you to work on that right now. So I closed it down. I was like, okay, God, and like super frustrated. And I was just like, what are you doing? Like, let's show me something. Um, where are you calling me to? And he says, it's time to move in this transition period. It's time to move to, I'm calling you to be, go into youth ministry. And I was like, oh, that's not going to help me. That's not going to help me. That's not, you don't know, I, I'm not that guy. I'm not the one that can stand in front of people, and especially young, young people. I'm only 19 myself. How am I going to do this? How am I going to speak to them? Um, and I remember so clearly in that moment, God said, I'm not asking you to figure it out. I will be the one to show you how. I will be the, the way. I will do it. You just need to go. So I did. And for eight years, I led that, that youth ministry, and it was great. And I had a great time. Um, and we, moved, we went to my last, I think it was summer camp. And we're worshiping, and, and if you guys know how when I get to camp, I like to tell the kids and some of the youth that are in here this morning, um, we don't walk onto campus, onto, the, onto Camp Cedar Crest, until we put some expectations of what we want God to do in our lives this weekend. Because God will move. If we say, hey, we, want, we, we need this this weekend, he will move. And so we do that, and, and I, I kind of stayed out of it. Let the kids answer, okay, good, cool, let's go, let's go do our thing. We get into worship that first night, and God says, okay, it's time to go again. It's time to go. And I was like, nope, nope, I'm not doing this. I'm not at all doing this. And so um, 
throughout the whole week, I didn't let God kind of speak to me. I didn't allow him to work through it because I was like, nope, you're not doing this. You do not get to move me again. Um, and the last night, you don't, get to, you don't get to do that. And he said, okay, but you're still going to go. You're still going to do this. And ultimately, I had to make a decision, and I'll kind of give you guys more what the story is as we get through um, midway through the message, and we'll conclude that story. But we all have to make a decision on how we're going to respond to God. Ultimately, that's it. We have to decide how we're going to respond to God. And that, this morning, this new series called Into the Deep, an adventure um, with the story of Jonah, is really just that. A man receives a calling from God, receives, hey, you're going to go here, and you're going to speak out against Nineveh. And then we see how he responds. Well, the one thing that we're going to learn with, with Jonah is that he's a rebellious prophet. He's one that, you know, you know okay, God, I, I'm good. I'm here. I'll, I'll do what you want when I want. I'll be, I'm in this area of my life. I'm not moving. Um, because he hates that God loves his enemies. God, we find ourselves there sometimes as well, I think. I know for myself, I'm like, God, really? That person? But God says, no, no, I have love for all people. All people. And so as, this, as we start to interact with Jonah, we're going to see that Jonah acts as a mirror for us. Because we are going to find moment after moment after moment when we're looking at Jonah and we're saying, Jonah, what are you doing? And then you're looking at yourself and saying, ooh, yeah, that's kind of me. That's kind of me. So this morning as we jump in, we're going to go right in, into it. So we're going to be in Jonah chapter 1. And we're going to go through all 17 verses this morning. So let's jump in. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amity, arising, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for the e their evil has come up before me. God calls Jonah and says, Hey, you need to go to Nineveh. Some of us would be like, oh, Okay, so who cares? What does it matter? Go to, go to Nineveh, come home, and you're good. No, but Nineveh during that time, it was the capital of this Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrian Empire was known as that world power back then. They were bitter enemies of the Hebrew people. They were people that time after time after time have gone after the people of God. This city was a great city. Even the Bible says that, right? In, the, in verse 2, you see where it says, the, that, um, that it's a great city. The population was numerous. The walls went for miles and miles around the city to protect it. Not even that, but the, the width of the walls. They were said that you can race probably three chariots, and that, those, are, those, those are big things. They can, you can line three of them up and race them across, and you still had room. These walls were massive. They were massive. The city of Nineveh wasn't just known for their architecture, wasn't just known for that and, and all that, but they were a ruthless people. They were people that were um, violent and um, just really strong warriors. And what they would do is they would, they would decimate, they would take care of, and they would destroy anything that came against them. Any lands that they decided to take over, they're going to do it. They're going to take it over. They were ruthless people, and they worshipped gods, not, the, not God, but they worshipped many gods. They even thought that their ruler was of a of divine div, um, deity. This wasn't the place that the people of God would go, okay, I'm going to go on vacation to. They're not going to go, and they're not going to take their, their swim trunks, and they're not going over there and spending time in the sun. And No, this was a dangerous place for the people of God. They were terrified to be anywhere near this city. Imagine for yourself what Jonah might have been feeling in that moment. God says, you're going to go, and you're going to go to Nineveh. What do you think those feelings are? I know for myself, I'd probably be scared. I know there'd probably be some, uh, God, I don't think I'm qualified for that. I don't think you've, I think you might have got the wrong guy. 
But can I tell you this morning that God will move in ways that we don't understand? He will move. He knows that we can handle it. He knows that we can honestly handle the situation that he's about to give us. So go ahead and write this first point down. It says, God will often require us to move in the uncomfortable. God knows that we like to get real comfortable. Jonah got real comfortable. He knows that when we get comfortable, trying to move out of comfortability is not easy. The problem when we start to get really comfortable is, is something really big, is that we start relying on this, relying on myself or relying on ourselves rather than relying on God. And then it says, then that's really saying, God, I know best. I know what's best for my life. Thank you, but I'll, I'll consult you when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm ready. When God says, no, I will be there. I will instruct you. I will give you the way to do this. Maybe God this morning is calling us out of the comfortable. That could literally be out of a job that is just beating you down and you can't get out of. Maybe it's, a, um, maybe it's that we're getting called to move into new circles of influences because God says they're ready for this. They're ready to hear this. Maybe for you high schoolers or junior hires in here, maybe it's, it's simply inviting someone to church or simply even just inviting them to youth group. God wants us to get out of the uncomfortable because something happens when we move. When we move out of our comfortability, our faith exponentially grows. It exponentially will grow. God is going to ask us, is going to request us to do some really hard things. Not going to lie about that. God is going to request us to do some really hard things. Things we don't like, things that we're going to get angry about. The reality is, is that we find our same spot, our same, our same um, way with how Jonah is going. We find, we look at it and we say, yeah, I have some areas of my life that I, I don't know if I can go do what you're calling me, God. But we're going to have to come to a place where our faith is going to have to take over. Because we can't do it on our own. We aren't meant to do life on our own. We're meant to have community. That's why, life, that's why our, our connect groups and um, community here in this, in, in, inside here is so important because you don't have to do it alone. You don't have to do it alone. Let's keep reading to see how Jonah responds. It says in verse 3, But Jonah, of course, it wasn't just this easy story. God said this, go do this, and he did it. It says, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it uh, to go to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah says, I'm out. I'm done. I'm not doing this prophet thing no more. God, I'm, see you later. God runs in the exact, op- or no, Jonah, not God. Jonah runs in the exact opposite direction of Nineveh. I have a map to show, just kind of give you a, 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 um, a visual of where, I mean, I should get out of the way, um, Joppa, where he's at, right? He goes down to get on the, on the ship. Nineveh is just a sh- straight shot up. He instead says, I'm going to go all the way across the Mediterranean Sea to go to Tarshish. Jonah wants to avoid at all cost. This is like the known world at that time. He's avoiding at all cost to go to Nineveh. He doesn't want to offer his enemies a chance of repentance in God's grace. And church, can I tell you, are we in that same boat? Do we hold back what God might be trying to say? I need to be with them. I need you to go to speak to them. It is a hard, hard thing. It is not easy to do. But God calls us to it. So Jonah got on this boat, and he's headed out in the opposite direction. I can tell you, you can run from God all you want. You can run. But God will continually, and I mean continually, run after you. That's just who he is. He is not going to give up on you. He is not going to quit. He is not going to just say, hi, I'm out of here. He says, great, you're going to run. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to go with you. 
What I believe that Jonah is really saying by running from God when he gets on the ship is, is God, there are areas in my life, there are areas that I am okay with you speaking to, I am okay with you, you know, giving me where you want me to go, but there are areas in my life that are off limits. There are area in my, areas in my life that, God, I am not okay with you moving me in. God, there are areas and there are things that you are allowed to talk to me about, and there are things that are in your life that you are not allowed to talk to me about. But can I tell you that your, our God will continuously and so faithfully go after us? Go ahead and write this uh, next point down, point number two. God relentlessly pursues us. To kind of conclude that, that story that I was telling you earlier, um, God told me to go. And he said, this is going to require a lot more faith this time. It's going to require you to have a lot more faith that I'm going to move and I'm going to show you the way. And so the last night of worship, I'm at this point, I'm spent. Because if you guys have been to youth camp, by that fourth night, you're like, I just can't wait for my bed. I just can't wait to be laying down and I don't have to smell all those smells anymore and I don't have to, I don't have to do anything I get to finally be home. And so I'm sitting there, and, and if you guys know, there's, um, when, when camp happens, kids just flood the, the stage. And right down here, there's a million kids just worshiping God. And usually, I would kind of just go be in the back area with them, but decided, you know, I'm going to stay here tonight. So I'm sitting back there, and um, I was just like, whatever, God's not speaking, okay. Well, I don't know, I don't know, God. I, I thought you were speaking earlier. Um, and after the worship after worship service, um, one of my youth comes up to me, and she's just bawling. I'm like, uh-oh, where is my other youth leader, the girl youth leader, where is she? Because um, I was like, I, I don't know what's about to happen. I don't know why she's crying, but I want to have someone here with me. And so she looks at me, and she goes, no, it's not anything about me. It's about you. And she, uh, she tells me something that it just, to this time, to the, for, till, even today, it hits me. It says, she told me, the time has come, stop running, and go. And it hit me like a ton of bricks because what was crazy about it was I was supposed to be her youth pastor. And instead, she was coming to me and telling me, God is telling me that it's time for you to go and you need to go. I ended up coming here saying, God, where do you want me to go? You've taken me, you've moved me, show me where. And he says, you're already here. I've, I've brought you here. Now rest. Rest. Just rest. The amazing thing about our God is no matter how hard we fight to run, no matter how hard we fight to say, I am done, God, I'm rowing this way, he says, "Mm -mm, I'm coming after you. As I love you so much that I cannot, I will not allow you just to go away. As we think about Jonah's situation and we think about my own situation and and your guys' situation as well, Can I say, just because something is provided to you, something that that is provided to you doesn't mean it came from the Lord. Jonah doesn't get to the sea and say, well, there's there's all these boats. Thank you, God. I'm off to Tarshish. (laughs) No. If we're running from the Lord, can I tell you, there will always be a boat waiting for you. There will always be something to take you away from what God is calling you to. Always, whether it's us, whether it's circumstances, whether it's situation, whether it's finances, whether it is um, whatever the case might be, there will always be something to take you away from what God's calling you to. The last thing the enemy wants is you to follow what God has for you. The last thing he wants for you. The enemy provides as well. He will give us things that, you know, will stop us from fulfilling what God has called us to. Do you believe that, you, that God has the right to speak into every part of your life this morning? I want you to think about that, but does God have every right to speak into every part of your life this morning? Jonah didn't want to leave his comfortability. He didn't want to leave his home. He didn't want to go leave his friends, leave his, comfort, his, his area of life. He said, no, I'm good. I'm comfortable. Thank you, God, but I'm good. 
You may not be where you want to be, but the question is, are you where God wants you to be? Think about that this morning as we keep reading. In verse 4 it says, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so the ship threatened to break up. This, this storm is massive. It is starting to break, hit against the ship um, so hard that if it doesn't relent, if nothing changes, this boat is going to be decimated. It's going to be gone, um, and all the people in it as well. This is a crisis moment for, the, for Jonah and the sailors on the ship. In verse 5 it says, The, mariner, the mariners were, af- uh, were afraid, and they cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. You know it's a bad storm (laughs) when the sailors, the people living on the water, are literally scared out of their mind and they're throwing everything they own out of the ship so that it wouldn't break. You know it's a bad, bad time. The storm is a crisis. The sailors are crying out to their gods. These aren't God-fearing guys. They're not Christians. They're not ones that know who God is. They're crying out to all their different gods to say, at least someone will, will, one God must answer us, must save us. These, these sailors, there's people that are, that are there are getting so spiritual, are trying to figure out how to solve this. They know that something divine is going on in this moment. They know that. They know there's something divine going on in this moment. What happens when we are in a crisis? What happens A lot of times we get really spiritual and say, God, God, please, if you do this, if you do that, I promise you, I promise you that I'll do this. I promise you. And then the crisis ends. We get out of that moment. And then what happens? We kind of fall back. And we go back to the way we were. These are the very sailors, and they just don't understand the love of God. They don't. They understand fear, and that's what drives them. Can I say this morning, let's not operate in fear. Let's not operate in fear. Ultimately, we worship our God because he loves us so much. Not because we're in fear. We worship a God that loves us. Let's keep reading. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. Really. Jonah, there's a storm going on. Do you not see it? So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Some of you uh, parents that have youth, I know that's what you tell your kids. Um, what do you mean, you sleeper? Get up, come on. Um, arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the, the God will give, give a thought to us and that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots uh, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, tell us uh, whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? He's about to go through an interrogation. (laughs) What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? Where are your people? Or where, what are your people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. Really? Really? Um, Who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So at this point, the sea is raging and just going crazy, and Jonah is um, down there sleeping, just sleeping. I think there could be a possibility. Now, there's nothing in the Bible that says this, but I think maybe, maybe he was sick. The sea is going crazy right now. I know I can't get on a boat, and if it's going like that, good luck. I'm about to feed the fish. Um, I cannot. And so sometimes, I can't even get on the teacups at Disneyland. Let's be real. (laughs) Ask Allie. We never get on it. Jonah could very well be sick in this moment. Sometimes when we live outside of the will of God, sometimes it affects us physically. It affects us to the point, like Jonah, he had to go to sleep. He had to just get away for a moment, and he had to sleep. These sailors, they start coming to him, and they start questioning him and says, what happened? What did you do? How did this happen? Like, you need to figure this out. You need to figure this out. And can I tell you that sometimes your sin doesn't just involve yourself. It doesn't just involve yourself. When Jonah got on the boat, 
and God hurled the, the storm at them, it now involved the sailors as well. It can affect other people when we decide to run from what God has called us to do. It can affect other people and what they've called for them to do. Let's keep reading. It says in verse 11, And then they said to him, What shall we do to you? (laughs) That the sea may quiet down for us. For the sea grew more and more temptress. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. And the sea will quiet down for you. I probably would have said, okay, let's go. For I know it is because of me that it is this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to the dry land, and they, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempted against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not us on innocent blood. For you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and they, the sea ceased from raging. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly. Okay, just imagine this for a moment. You know, if you have kids, or maybe when you were a young kid, you kind of stand by the pool, and your little brother is sitting there or something, and you, you, grab, okay, you grab his arm, and, and I'll grab his leg, and you kind of just swing them back and forth. And, and I know, I, that's what I picture here, is that the sailors pick up Jonah, and like, all right, one, two, and three, and then they just throw him into the ocean. Sometimes God's going to ask us to do hard things. He's going to ask us to do hard things. This storm has come upon everyone on the ship, right? The storm is being, and they are at a crisis moment. And what we see is this storm rages and rages. What happens when they try to row from it? It just gets even worse. They're trying to row way out of the storm, which kind of like, you know your rows aren't going to work. There's a storm. Like, come on. Um, but nothing changes, and this is crucial. Until the people in the storm surrender. Until the people, that's our third point. Go ahead and write this down. It says, God desires to bring us to a place of surrender. Your life is or will have some moments in it that you will not be able to manage. You will not be able to control on your own. Whether it be a sickness in your body or it be the loss of a job or whether it be um, anything Maybe it's your, your friend betrays you or you can't have kids or whatever that case might be. But when we're in the storm and we surrender, it becomes a, 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 a storm with a purpose. It becomes a storm with a purpose. God is over all storms. He doesn't cause all storms. But he is over all things. He is over all storms. A good example is in in the Old Testament when Joseph and his his brothers, (laughs) they sell him into slavery. Falsely accused, he's wrongly imprisoned, all these things. He's got a rough deal. But he gets this moment, and I believe it's Genesis 50, that he comes face to face with his family, the people that kind of gave him out and just here you go, sold him into slavery, and he says, what was intended for evil, God used for good. And can I tell you that storms are not going to be easy. The storms are going to be rough, and it might feel like your life is just about to break into a million pieces, and there's no way out of it. Can I tell you God's calling you to surrender? God is calling us to say, I can't do this. You have to. You have to. Initially, these sailors are trying to get out of this super quick. They're like, "Ah, you know what? Instead of throwing Jonah over, we'll just row through this. Which, okay. Some of us have been rowing against what God is calling in our lives for so long now. And the outcome, I can imagine, is one of exhausting and overwhelming because you can never get ahead. You can never get to that next moment. Because we're continually rowing against what God had, has spoken. Jonah, after some time, he surrenders in the midst of the storm. It might be like, when did he surrender? When they ask, when they say, when, when Jonah says, throw me overboard, and they end up doing the one, two, three, throw. Um, he is literally saying, God, I surrender to your will. I surrender to what you're going to do because what I'm doing is not working. I surrender to you in this storm right now.
You can either choose to run like Jonah did, or you can either choose, or you can choose to row like uh, the sailors did. But can I tell you that you will always have a never-ending, relentless, overwhelming storm if you try to do it on your own. Always. You will always have that. It had to be terrifying for Jonah to just be thrown into the sea, to not know what, his light, what the outcome was going to be. But a lot of times that's the same for us. We get thrown in and say, hey, God, what are you going to do? I surrender. I need you to work it out. What happens when you surrender in the midst of the storm? It becomes a grace storm, a storm that is really with purpose. And we stop asking the question of why, God, why me? Why did I have to have this? Why is it only to me that this is happening? Why am I the only one losing my job? Why is this? Why is that? And it's okay to ask those questions. It's not okay to stay there. Can I tell you, when we start to move our perspective and we say, okay, God, who, God, do you want me to be in the midst of this storm? Who are you calling me to be in the midst of this storm right now? Where do you want me to go in the midst of this storm? I can tell you right now, my first year of marriage was a great year, but it also had some huge storms in it. It had some storms that when I look back, I'm like, I, I don't know how we made it out sometimes. We were in the hospital multiple times. We, were, we had constantly had things going on in our apartment, and it just seemed like nothing was ever working out. It seemed like, God, where are you in this? Where are you? And I had, when we moved over here, we, I had this moment of this complete meltdown, this complete time of, God, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do it right And I was in the shower, the one, and, and I just had this moment of just crying and just not knowing how to, to, to do it. And I had to ask myself those two questions. God, who do you want me to be in the midst of the storm, and where do you want to take me? And can I tell you, once that started to happen, and I let the control go and let the things go that I was holding on to, and I said, God, you can be the one to do this. You can show me where to go. I surrender it to you. Can I tell you that my life was refreshed in that moment? It was a moment that I had to decide God, I can't do it anymore. I can't. The same is going to be true for Jonah. He's going to be worked through with God, and God's going to move him to where he needs to be. Let's finish reading the last verse. and says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the, of the fish for three days and three nights. As Jonah surrendered to God... God took him in a form of a fish. Can I tell you that that had to be smelly? That had to be gross? That had to be not ideal? It is my, yeah, it is my worst nightmare to ever be thrown over a boat. I hate the ocean. Um, and if God took me in a fish, oh man. But can I tell you the fish acts as a saving grace for Jonah? It may not be pretty. It may not be smelling the great like roses, It's probably going to smell all gunky in there. But when we surrender to the will of God, he says, okay, let me start working now. Let me start start working on your life. Let me start working through what this means for you. And as we do that, it's going to bring up vulnerable things. It's going to bring up things that we haven't dealt with. It's going to bring up areas in our lives that we need to deal with. And that's going to get messy. And that's going to get gross. But at the end of it, God says, okay, you're ready to go. And he's going to do that with Jonah. And you're going to see that he gets to move to Nineveh. And we'll pick up next week where, where, um, where Jonah leaves, where he's going to be at. Um, as the band goes, ahead, uh, we're going to go ahead and close. And as the band comes up, the good news is that there is a greater Jonah out there. There was a greater Jonah, and, that, and his name was Jesus. Jesus came to earth to take the place to be able to He was going to be rejected and despised and slaughtered. He was going to be the one to sacrifice his self. He was going to be sacrificed by his people's bitter enemies. Unlike Jonah's initial response, Jesus is going to say, I'll do it. I'll do it because I love them so much. We are Nineveh, and Jesus came to save us. Uh, Like the sailors and the Ninevites, we need to be saved from our sin. We do. 
the good news is that the gospel, the gospel of Jesus, gives us that opportunity. Gives us that opportunity to be to find salvation. And the good thing is, is it's not just for me and you. It's also for all people. Jesus came to save all people. For those of you here today that might be fearing the will of, of God, can I encourage you, don't run from it. Don't run from what God is calling you to do. Don't row against it. Don't try to move away from it. Don't try to, to, to push away God. Instead, take that storm and say, God, I don't like it, but I'm going to go through this. I'm going to be vulnerable with you. I'm going to let you do what you need to do. I'm going to surrender in the midst of it. I'm going to dive deep with you. It all starts with making that decision to stop running from God and say, God, I surrender. We're going to find that that's what Jonah is going to end up doing. We're going to now, we're going to move into a time of worship. And as we do, can I encourage you just to allow God to move in a way that is so fresh and so, so directed towards your situation? We all go through things. We're going to all go through things. And God says, just let me in. Let me be the one to come and fill that gap. Let me be the one to, to, to uh, do what, I, what you need, do what I've called you to do. Allow yourself to lean in this morning as we take a moment to worship.